Welcome to this video on Language Paper 1. This is the fourth video in a series I'm doing on the story of an R by Kate Chopin. If you haven't watched the first three videos, then I recommend that you go back and do that because in those videos we read the fictional source and we do questions one, two and three. Today we're going to look at question four and the question four will say something along the lines of having read this section of the text, a student said, and then it gives you a critical comment an opinion about the text, to what extent do you agree? For this question, you'll write four analytical paragraphs presenting your argument. You've got 20 marks and you'll take about 20 minutes to write your answer. So let's jump in and have a look at the question. It says, focus this part of your response on paragraph five onwards. So as with questions one and two, this particular question tells you which part of the text it wants you to focus on. If you look at a section of the text which is different from this, then you'll risk losing your marks. Then the question says, having read this section of the text, a student commented, Mrs. Mallard is completely liberated from an unhappy, constrictive marriage. She is energised by this transformation in her life. To what extent do you agree? So you get a student reflecting on the text and you have to say if you agree completely, if you agree a little bit, if you have moments of disagreement as well. Then the question gives you some bullet points to guide you. So in your response, you could consider the students' reactions in this part of the story, evaluate how the writer presents Mrs. Mallard's liberation, and support your response with references to the text. You've got 20 marks, so there's 20 minutes, um, and you should be writing about four paragraphs. So before I write my answer, I'm just going to do a quick plan. So I've got an agree, disagree table here. And in our agree column, I've said that Mrs. Mallard is energised by the transformation. In the disagree, I say that she's not energised. And this is something that you can do in your exam. Do you sketch yourself two columns quickly and jot your ideas down? It means that your answer is going to be really clear and coherent when you come to write it and that you can construct an effective argument. So first of all, I'm looking for evidence to agree that Mrs. Mallard is energised. Um, so I'm going to say here, um, Mrs. Mallard undergoes a physical transformation. Um, and I'm just going to look for some evidence from the text. Um, so I'll say her eyes stayed keen and bright. Her pulse beat fast. So she seems to gain energy. OK, then I'm looking back at the text to see what else I can find. Um, I'm going to say that Mrs. Mallard is presented as um, looking forward to the time she will now have to herself and to make her own decisions. And my evidence for that is she opened and spread her arms out to the R's in welcome. OK, I'm trying to get three bits of evidence in this column. I think I'm going to go for the last line of the text. So Mrs. Mallard is portrayed as joyous um, by the idea of freedom from patriarchal restrictions. And my evidence is this final line, free body and soul free, she kept whispering. OK, then looking for evidence to disagree. Now, you don't necessarily need to have this in the exam. Um, and I really wouldn't recommend scraping the bottom of the barrel to try and come up with something for this. Only have a disagree idea if you think it's relevant. Um, so I'm just looking back at the text. And there's this idea that she is going to be really unhappy at the funeral for her husband. Um, so I'm going to say that Mrs. Mallard does have moments of unhappiness in which she does not seem energised. My evidence for that is she knew that she would weep again. OK, so I've got my plan. I'm just going to label it now so I know what order I'm going to do my paragraphs in. Um, and I'm going to use what I call the XXOX structure. So X is my main argument and O is the other side of my argument. And I'm going to just go chronologically through. So that's X1. Then on my second paragraph is going to be x2. Then I'm going to go to the other side of the argument and put that paragraph in. And then I'm going to finish with x3. So I know what order my paragraphs are going to go in and I know what I'm going to write. And that's really going to help me to create a really clear and coherent answer. 
So I'm going to show you how I would write up my answer for this uh, question. Now I'd aim to have four paragraphs as I've planned, but I'm going to only show you one paragraph. And remember, we're making an argument here. So this is about using our evidence and our analysis of that evidence to build up a picture of our point of view on the text. So I'm going to start um, by using some of the wording from the question in order to create my first sentence. Um, so I'm going to say, as the text progresses, it becomes increasingly clear that Mrs Mallard is presented as welcoming the new possibilities that life will offer her now that she is free from the constraints of marriage. And what I'm doing there, as I've said, is using some of the wording of the question in order to show that I'm responding directly to the statement that I've been asked to consider. Now I'm going to insert um, some evidence, some quotations from the text just to support my assertion. Um, so for instance, um, as she considers the new possibilities of life, Mrs Mallard's eyes stayed keen and bright, her pulse beat fast. And as you'll notice, I've done exactly the same thing as I've done in the other questions in terms of embedding my evidence smoothly and fluently. So I've told a little snippet of the story and then I've used that quotation, that evidence to finish off that bit of the story. So now I'm going to look at the surface meaning of this quotation and to look at that the word ostensibly is really useful. Ostensibly just means on the surface, the most obvious explanation of this particular quotation. So ostensibly Chopin conveys how Mrs Mallard's renewed enthusiasm for life is demonstrated in her physical responses as she becomes more energised with a fast pulse and bright eyes. So look at how I'm picking out words from the quotation as I'm explaining and analysing. I'm linking my comments directly in with the text. And then when I do ostensibly, I also then use the phrase on closer inspection because I've looked at the surface meaning and now I'm going to start to peel away the layers of meaning in the text. So yet on closer inspection, this energy is not simply Mrs Mallard's physical form, but also in her mind. I'm going to put a semicolon because I want to explain that a little bit more. So our semicolon just triggers that greater level of depth. So the adjectives keen and bright indicate an inner awakening, as if her mind has been released from the shackles of Victorian patriarchy. Okay, then I'm going to add in an even kind of deeper level of analysis. So I'm going to, I've looked at the word keen, but I'm going to look at it in more detail. So additionally, the adjective keen, so I'm using some subject terminology there with the word adjective. So additionally, the adjective keen indicates that Chopin is emphasizing Mrs. Mallard's intense desire to seize the day. Okay, now what's really interesting for me here is that actually there's a possibility of another side to the argument, because if we look at that increase in the pulse, actually, yes, it could show energy and an enthusiasm, but could it also show a bit of fear and anxiety as well? So I'm going to bring in that other side of the argument with the connective however. So however, it could be argued that instead of communicating positivity, the fast pulse could signal Mrs. Mallard's fearfulness as an elevated pulse can be a symptom of anxiety. So I'm going to say here perhaps Chopin is revealing both the excitement and the reservations. And by reservations, I just mean kind of anxiety, fears. So both the excitement and the reservations that Mrs Mallard has about her new life. Now I'm just going to look through my answer and check that I've done everything that I need to. Um, I've got my kind of response to the question here. So I'm really clearly using the student's words in order to show that I'm engaging with the question. I've got some evidence which I've embedded really fluently there. And then here, 
this whole section, I'm really zooming in and I'm analysing that evidence. As I'm doing that, I'm using subject terminology. Um, so, for example, I've got mentioned adjectives a couple of times um, there. Yeah, so I'm using some subject terminology, not a huge amount, but enough. And I think this is the thing with um, vocabulary, that we need to use a vocabulary appropriately, not just to show off or not just to, to kind of be as complicated as we possibly can, but to use that subject terminology, that vocabulary as appropriate. OK, I'm pretty pleased with that answer. So I would then continue to write my um, next three paragraphs as well, and then that answer would be completed. So let's just take a quick look at the um, excellence criteria before we finish this section of the paper. So we need a detailed response, so that would be around four paragraphs, clear focus on the question, you see that in the yellow section there, direct evidence from the text, which is the blue section, and I need to analyse the evidence, which is green, and use my subject terminology, which is pink. So thank you very much. The next video is going to be on question five, which is the creative writing question.